Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Before we start, I want to thank my latest Patreon subscriber, Peter, for his support, and all my other Patreon subscribers for their continued support. This podcast would struggle to continue without them, and my Patreon page has become a great place to learn about and to chat about all aspects of conducting. There'll be more about my Patreon page later on in this episode. Today, I conduct a conversation with an English conductor who started his musical career as a violinist, leading professional orchestras from a very young age. He's held title positions in Norway, Sweden, Greece and the United Kingdom and is currently Conductor Laureate and Artistic Advisor of the Charlotte Symphony Orchestra in the United States. It's a great pleasure to welcome Christopher Warren Green. Christopher, it's lovely to meet you today. Uh, I can't believe after all of these years it's the first time I've met you because, you know, two ex-orchestral violinists chatting over Zoom. How are you? I'm very well, and it's great to meet you too. Good. Um, I mentioned the violin, but I read that you were a chorister, and I wonder whether, going right back to your childhood, did you come from a musical family, and how did uh, being a chorister at Westminster School and the violin come about? Well, my grandmother and my grandfather were from coal mining stock, and they knew that uh, their children should learn instruments. Mm. Uh, They realised that it was important to their overall education. And so my mother was a pianist, my uncle a violinist, but I became a musician really because I was singing in a church choir and it's the best musical training for any child. And then finally, after the Beatles, et cetera, I fell in love <laughs> with the Thomas Tallis Fantasia on a, uh, uh, well, the, the theme of Thomas Tallis mm. uh, by Ray Fort Williams. And that was it. I had to become a musician. I just, you know, that happened much later though. Um, I was a chorister at seven through to about 13. Oh, and when did you start the violin? Because I I started at nine, which I know is relatively late. I wonder whether you, when you started. Well, I started at 13, which is far too late. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Uh, Michael, why do you think I ended up as a conductor? (laughs) (laughs) That's a meteoric rise. If you didn't start until you were 13 and you were the leader of the BBC National Orchestra of Wales at the age of 19, if Wikipedia can be trusted, that's quite a. No. Quite a meteoric rise. The National Orchestra of Wales was 21. I I haven't seen a Wikipedia. I was 21, and I was 24 with the Philharmonia. Um, But But still. At 19, I was actually leader of the London Palladium Orchestra. Right. Which which is in the book that was written about the London Chamber Orchestra. And for many years, one couldn't speak about those things because there was so much snobbery in the industry. Yeah. And, And yet I knew... Myself, that you know, Neville Mariner, who was a close friend, had played in theatres. And you know, as a musician and conductor and violinist and conductor, you know that, you know, good people play all sorts of music from at certain points in their life. Mm. And the snobbery that's attached is what actually strangles our art form. Yeah. So that's where the 19 comes from. Yeah. And yeah. really, I think by the age of 17, I was working in the profession because I just wanted to. I, it was... The, the, you say meteoric, and many people have said that, but uh, I think I paid for it later, later <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the sort of violin burnout, if, if that's a, a phrase. Um, well, I had to learn. I learned had had to learn how to do it on, you know, literally, um, whilst flying into a dogfight. Um, yeah. We yeah. learn the most in the profession, do we not? Yes, um, much more than we do when we're students, and there were. Like the BBC Welsh, for instance, in at the age of 21. I don't know how the heck I got that job. Leonard Hirsch was on the panel for that, the first leader of the Philharmonia with Parian. And I, I got the job, then I thought, now what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. mostly petrified. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost all happened by accident because I dreamt all the things that have happened to me in my life. I dreamt them. I, I, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't chase them? I always mm. chase the music. That's the important message for young people. Chase the music. And I say to the assistant conductors of my orchestra in America always, don't chase the career. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should have. <laughs> no, I think, I think you're it, right. I think you're right. Yeah. I think there has to be a level of, for the conductors who are, are respected by players, there has to be a level of 
uh, of uh, you know doing your time whether it was like you and I in in an orchestra as a as a player and then going into conducting or even as a, an assistant who's been assistant in a couple of places and done done a C list orchestra somewhere and then and gone through the ranks you know yeah. they're, they're yeah. the people that we as musicians when we played respected possibly more than the the wunderkinds who appeared out of nowhere who'd won a competition or something like that well, it's true. And also, I remember Neville Mariner saying to me once, he said, the trouble with a lot of youngsters nowadays is they're too well brought up, <laughs> <laughs> meaning they should have played in some theatre pits and things like that, and yeah. really learnt everything you can learn uh, about music. And the the problem with for poor young conductors is that you can only learn to conduct in front of an orchestra. Yes. This sort of practicing in front of a mirror, or I know we've got cameras. And it's nonsense. This is choreography. You can only learn by reacting really fast to what you're given by these wonderful musicians in front of you. Mm. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here. Well, I'm not because broadcasting to many millions, but yeah. you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. And I, I think it's, it's, you know, we had the chance back in the day to go away and practice on, let's say, a C orchestra, for instance. Although there are no bad orchestras, really, only, no, you know, no, only, right. bad, only bad conductors. But <laughs> yes, you, you know, a, a, an orchestra that certainly wouldn't be able to afford the higher ranking conductors or the more experienced conductors. And that, that doesn't happen so much nowadays. I think a lot of youngsters are thrown in at the deep end. And then, you know, managements are quite happy to cast them out when um, I've probably said the wrong thing here and I'm going to be killed by my management. <laughs> but I'm talking about. I'm talking about orchestra management as well. You know, the, oh, that didn't make it. Let's throw another one in the mix. You know, yes, I think yeah. we, we've always known you should let musicians, especially conductors and soloists, well, no, all musicians, a chance to, you know, uh, nurture and, and 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 learn. It took me forever with my conducting, but with the violin in the beginning, it was as you say a meteoric rise. Yeah. But conducting is a very different thing. Um, I'm going to go back to your meteoric rise that short sort of eight year period when you would have been conducted by others whether that be a youth orchestra whether that be at the royal academy of music whether that be in the london palladium or and then you know before you end up at the bbc welsh as it used to be known and now the bbc national orchestra of wales at any point were you looking at these people i, I suspect you were like me and you just had blinkers on i want to play the violin in the profession and you weren't thinking yeah. about conductors but yes. is there anything you look back on from those times before we go into the profession in inverted commas at the BBC Welsh? Is there any of those conductors you look back on that think, actually, those are things that I maybe rely on or I think back on. I think, do you know what? That was good or that was bad. As we know, obviously, bad conductors inform us sometimes more often than good ones do. Well, yes, but it was really only until I came to the Philharmonia. Right. And the, those days, I was they were riding on the crest of a wave, and I took over from Carl Peeney. And they had so many famous leaders before me, concert masters, who were really phenomenal musicians. The list, if you look at, they were all famous. Um, so it was big boots to fill. And therefore, the, the orchestra had the best conductors. And Giulini came, and he was a huge influence on me. What I used to do was... I didn't try to memorize, as Simon Rattle says, don't try to memorize, don't do it. Just once you know it, then conduct from memory, but don't try to memorize something and go out and do it. Um, but I did memorize the violin parts because we played them so much. Mm. Of all Beethoven symphonies and then Brahms and the Mozart's and all the classics, the, the really difficult stuff. Mm. And I would just stare at the conductor, not because I wanted to become a conductor, because I'd always learned to conduct, even back in the London Palladium, where I was assistant MD, because I wanted to be a concertmaster. Yes. I'm a complete, I'm a complete accident where conducting is concerned. It just happened. Uh, but it is another form of leading an orchestra. So you can imagine sitting in the first chair of the Philharmonia Orchestra at the festival for all night after night. We had Heitink, we had Giulini, we had Kondrashin, we had Svetlanov, we had Ashkenazi, we had my chief at the time, who was Rick, Ricardo Muti. He was a big influence on me. But my mentor, and the chief guest conductor at that time, Laurie Marzal, and he ended up becoming my mentor alongside uh, uh, Sir Charles McCarris. Mm. Both of them taught me, yeah. uh, gave me a lot of lessons on conducting. Uh, they were the only conductors who knew I conducted because you know it's dangerous to let <laughs> conductors know <laughs> yeah. you're a conductor if yeah. you're playing in the orchestra. Yeah. Um, 
especially as the concertmaster, because there are times when you have to remind the conductor that he's a guest of the orchestra if he's not behaving properly. Mm. And that can often be taken as sour grapes mm. if if the conductor knows you're a conductor. Yes. So all that kept quiet. I've, div- I've digressed enormously here. But that was really, those were my influences. And I've yeah. lost both Lauren and Charles. And I, uh, they are such a great loss to the profession. I was yes. lucky. Well, I was I was lucky enough to play for Sir Charles McCarris. I never played for Lauren Marzell, um, but chatted to uh, Sir Charles McCarris about conducting because uh, I ended up conducting something in a concert he was conducting. Um, I think it was his 79th birthday, and uh, it was suggested that somebody jump up in front of the orchestra and conduct the Stravinsky Greetings Prelude. Um, oh, so he'd see me conduct. <laughs> yeah, he'd see me conduct. Um and so I can imagine, you know, how helpful that was. I mean, it's almost like you've read my questions because I was going to say, you know, what what teachers or mentors did you have? But coupled with that was, why did you want to conduct more often? Um, I know you said you conducted at the Palladium, but when did that little seed start coming in and thinking, do you know what, I'd like to start conducting more oh. than playing the violin? Uh, the seed was probably planted back at the Palladium when I was assistant right. and the, to Anthony Inglis, actually, who oh, was yeah. the uh, Lloyd Webber, a very close friend of mine. The uh, He was the Lloyd Webber music supervisor, and he encouraged me a lot to do that. And so the seeds were really sown at the London Palladium, I suppose. But the reason I wanted to do it was because I wanted to become a concertmaster. Yeah. And... After the London Palladium, I auditioned for uh, for Neville Mariner and played in the small group of Academy St. Martins. And then, Lord knows how, as you mentioned earlier, I got the BBC Welsh job. Um, but I knew I had to know the basics of how to conduct, and, and so I would be a good concertmaster. Mm. And then it just took over because even though I still to this day believe that I know absolutely nothing about conducting... <laughs> I I was always reinvited yeah. to uh, to some pretty good orchestras, you know. And so I thought, well, I must be doing something right. And it got to the stage where I was hardly playing the violin. Yeah. And so here's the key to your question, which is a good point. I realized at that point that if I stopped playing full time, you know, just don't play the violin and just focus on conducting, I started to hear and listen and analyze everything in a different way. Yeah. So I had to step back from the violin for that reason. Mm. And I didn't miss it at yeah. all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's because lots of my friends say, well, Chris, don't you miss the uh, violin? And I say, um, well, no, um, because the orchestra is the greatest instrument of all. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. I'm nodding in agreement. Absolutely. I, I've been asking yeah. exactly the same questions, as you can imagine. Nine years ago, I stopped playing. Um, and no, I don't miss it at all, because I'm I'm playing the greatest instrument there is. One tiny little thing has just popped into my head. Because we were on the the, the one side of the fence, you know, you were being a leader with the Philharmonia and, and, and I was in the CBSO. Uh, when the conducting started to happen, I got the feeling that I would never be taken seriously as a conductor until I retired as a violinist. Did the, Was that oh. something you thought about yourself? Yeah, and it's it's harder the more well-known you, you are as something. If you're really well-known as a soloist or, as a, sorry, as a concertmaster, yeah. it's actually quite hard to break into it. But I didn't try to break into it. No. Um, and certainly my career is much bigger in America and mm. in the rest of the world than it is in the UK, although I do conduct the London Orchestra orchestras and have conducted uh, UK orchestras. There's something about the prophet in his own land. You mm. suffer a little bit from that at times. And yes, I think um, it, it it's sometimes hard in the beginning to be accepted. Mm. Nowadays, I, I tend to see the press will say, they, they don't say violinist and conductor anymore. No. They say conductor Christopher Warren Green, which is, which is fine. Now I've got to an age, Michael, where I couldn't care less. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I yeah. just, you know, and I don't care which orchestras I conduct or where. It's just yeah. great making music. 
And, uh, you know, it's it's the best job in the world. You know, sometimes people say to me, you know, what is it you do? You stand in front of the orchestra. You must have had this question uh, yeah. a million times. You could tell your story. But it, mine, it goes like this. You know, so they say, I mean, you, you, you just stand in front of the orchestra, don't you? And you just beat time with, with a stick. You're just sort of beating time with the music. And nine times out of ten, I used to say, yeah, that's about right. That's the measure of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just leave it at that, you know. Yeah. But when I'm asked the question seriously, it's actually easier to answer because it's an enigma conducting. No one really knows what it takes to do. There are people, conductors with horrendous stick techniques uh, who are amazing, um, conductors with uh, fantastic stick techniques who are amazing or the other way around you mm. know but i think the answer is that conducting is the easiest thing in the world to do badly mm. and the hardest thing in the world to do well mm. uh you know it's and only experience in front of an orchestra can teach you that you just can't get it any other way um putting pieces together that are really difficult in a time frame also if you begin, you know i mean if we started on this podcast to discuss exactly what the intricacies of contracting are, we would be here till half past 2025. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, but but that, I think that's a, a one way of describing it, the easiest thing in the world to do badly. And the trouble is, we all think we can do it really well. And the real trouble is that there are some people who really, really cannot do it at all. Mm think, well, no, I'm going to do that because it's easy. You just beat four and a bar, three and a bar, whatever, you know. And they don't quite realise that they're really not very good at it, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. I mean, my answer is always to say to them, you know, if you're stood in front of a, a symphony orchestra of 85, most of the time they can play on their own. Yeah. The point being is that you need to be there to help them when the music needs shaping or speeding up or slowing down or stopping or starting. But you're also there to make have a positive influence on those 85 people to make that music come off the page through their instruments and out into the hall. And we can do that through rehearsal, through inspiration, through just a well-aimed sentence at the, at the right way to somebody to give them confidence to play more or less, whatever it is. And yeah, it's, it's, I, th I find it very much uh, along, you know, similar lines to a great sports coach, a Pep Guardiola or something like that. You know, he's got, he's surrounded himself by incredible players who could probably go out and still win games without him. But what he does is he makes them better um, through, you know, whatever it could be, disciplining them, through helping them, through pushing them, through changing formations, through all that sort of stuff. And that's sort see, of that's, what we do. Yeah, that's where I absolutely agree with you. I mean, yeah. I, I think that uh, to be a conductor, you must be, you must enable and inspire. Mm -hmm. So you're enabling those fantastic musicians in front of you to give of their very best from their hearts and put that in the hearts of the audience, which is where music exists. Mm. So in some way to inspire, certainly to enable. And um, you know, Lauren Mazel said to me once, we were sitting on an aeroplane, you know, I'd always go and lead the orchestra years after I'd left if they wanted a guest for Lauren. Mm. And uh, he actually launched my career as well, but that's another thing as a conductor, because he just, I've digressed, but he deliberately took a rehearsal off in Japan, knowing that the Philharmonia didn't have a... Um, an assistant conductor and that I would have to conduct. Mm. So then I, I was out of the closet from that moment on. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of man Lauren really was. He was a good person. Um, but he told me that you can conduct out of tune. And I thought, you know, you actually, uh, I kind of knew that from, from sitting in the auction, because if you're beating something to death, they can't hear. Mm. And uh, so, uh, as you know, as you know, um, and I remember Lynn Harrell once rounding, playing Dvorak Concerto, which is, hard enough for a cello to punch through yes. um, and yelling at a, a conductor to say, don't conduct so much, they can't hear. Mm. And the conductor stepped back and stopped beating flailing like a mad person. And uh, suddenly the, the Philharmonia actually played together, mm. you know? Mm. So, I mean, we could go on about this for hours, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the interesting point you made earlier on was, you listen to what comes at you and you adjust. And to use my sporting analogy, 
you know, Pep Guardiola doesn't come out at the, you know, on the on the eve of the match and say, we're going to play in this formation. Um, we're going to do this then. On 70 minutes, I'm going to take uh, Haaland off and put uh, Alvarez on. It, you know, he adjusts to the situation. He adjusts to the game. And what we have to do is do exactly that as conductors. And you said, you know, it's not a dance routine or whatever your 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 analogy was. And it is. It's about enabling. It's about responding in the moment. And sometimes the best thing to do is to stop conducting or to conduct far less, to let the orchestra go, well, you know, we need to listen to each other because he's not helping us here. Well, you know, there's a fine line yeah. between helping with the, the beat that you give and also getting in the way. And, and as you said, making an orchestra stop listening and being reliant on this intangible thing which is a stick hitting an imaginary space point in space <laughs> and that is apparently the beat you know it, yeah no yeah it, absolutely right yeah, yeah it's yeah, yeah it's, I, it's deafening for musicians yes it is it is so i mean it was going to be one of my questions before we go fully in and, and i want to go to america very soon but it was going to be one of my questions nowadays most orchestras have uh, an assistant conductor or somebody affiliated to the orchestra so that if there is a, a you know an accident or the conductor is stuck on a pl flight or a plane there will be a, a conductor in the wings waiting to come on but in the old days it was always the concertmaster or the leader was sort of told or you know so you, can you take over please other than that rehearsal were there other instances where you you did that where you suddenly had to sort of jump up and take over no that was the first time it ever happened yeah there was one other uh, time when um, the Philharmonia was always a very gentle orchestra um, with people, but uh, we had to remove a conductor before the concert because he was behaving very badly. Mm. And um, the chorus director was Jane Glover, yeah. and it was it was one of the big Bach uh, masses, or whatever. And we just went to Jane and said, "Look, can you take this over?" Because we knew she'd have it. It was her chorus, yeah. uh, so she took that over. No, I think what Lauren did was deliberate. Mm, mm. because I told him I didn't want anybody to know that I was conducting. Mm -hmm. And I think he deliberately, a bit like uh, Bernstein's career was uh, uh, launched yes. by, I've forgotten the Greek uh, It, name it was uh, Bruno Walter, the, the, the first jump in, but he, it was Metropolis who helped him out. Yeah, mm -hmm. to me, Metropolis, Metropolis yeah. 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 It was a bit like that. Um, yeah. But nowadays, I think it's wonderful that they do have assistant conductors, um, and if the assistant conductors have any brains, they'll learn something um, from the conductors and the musicians themselves, because yeah. mm -hmm. the, the orchestras are always very keen, especially yeah. to help a young conductor, so long as they're not standing up in front of the orchestra, behaving like they already know more about it than the orchestra, which mm -hmm. is never the case. Yeah, absolutely. It's as, it's as simple as that. That orchestra or the individuals first bassoon, for instance, will know much, much more about what's going on over there in the bassoons and et cetera. And I think one of the lucky things about having been orchestral players for us is what Leonard Slatkin said. He, he said that uh, you score if you played in the orchestra as long as you can. That's uh, helped because you know what it's like from the inside. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't always follow, of course. No, no. Yeah, but right. but I think it helps. You know, you can you can sniff in the room when you feel that it's time for a break because you know you just how it feels. You you can smell in the room when there's a problem. You can, you know, you you might have the right phrase to just calm people down or whatever else because you've been there and done it and you've heard it and you've you know you've seen people flounder. You've also seen somebody diffuse a situation with a, a well earned charming compliment or something like that. And and I think that helps, and I think it, it really does to to know how a section works, just to how a, you know a violin section works, how that, uh, that yeah. I I often say I wished I'd done this sooner, but by having done twenty two years as a player, I think you know that it's it's immeasurable help. Um, yeah. I mean, what's interesting in the CBSO was when there was a moment, uh, I remember a particular, I've, inter I've interviewed him on this podcast, Dmitry Slobodanyuk turned around to Lawrence Jackson, the leader of the CBSO, and said, can you stand up and conduct so I can go out and listen? Lawrence said, no, I can't, but there's a guy over there in the seconds who'll do it for you. Uh, and, and so everybody knew I was doing it because I'd conducted at local amateur orchestras and I'd also conducted the CBSO itself. And so they, they I, I couldn't hide. I, I couldn't stay in the closet. Uh, I was there, yeah. you know, that everybody knew. And I was inviting my friends as soloists with my amateur orchestra, so they knew that I was doing it. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, the giveaway being in, in recording sessions when everybody else is reading the paper, I had a score open on the floor looking at something I was about to conduct. Um, I used to have to rush home with my score and write down a lot of the things that the great conductors had said during rehearsal into my score. I yeah. couldn't really sit on the front on the front stand with a, a score in front of me as well. No, no. Uh, yeah, it puts pressure on, on him. <laughs> exactly. That'll put well, pressure, puts on, pressure on the conductor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's checking up on me. <laughs> so... You've been music director of the London Chamber Orchestra since 1988, um, but you've had other jobs, uh, Nordic Chamber Orchestra. Uh, I even I had to look this name up and to learn how to pronounce it. The Jun Shopping Symphonia, uh, Symphonietta in Sweden, and then also an orchestra in Athens. Um, but the big job really has been in the United States uh, from 2010 onwards, the Charlotte Symphony Orchestra, and you've now gone from being music director to conductor, laureate, and artistic advisor. Um, the United States versus the UK. Funding obviously is different, but also the role of the music director is vastly different. How did you, how did you manage to go from, let's say, the London Chamber Orchestra, which you know you're looking at trying to get Arts Council funding and private sponsorship, and that's where there is a similarity to so somewhere like Charlotte, and and you know going and pressing the flesh and being the figurehead for that orchestra. How did you find it? It was a bit of a culture shock, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, because all the orchestras that you've mentioned, including uh, <clears throat> the orchestra in the Megaron, which was Neville Mariner's orchestra, it, right. he he, um, he uh, got me in there. Thank thank you yet again to Neville, dear Neville. Um, they were the sort of orchestras, although I was guesting with Minnesota, Philadelphia and places like that, but they were the sort of orchestras at St. Louis, big orchestras, Philharmonia, London Philharmonic, Royal Philharmonic, big orchestras. I'd never had a big orchestra. I'd never been the chief of a big orchestra. Yeah, yeah. So I was very much part of the team. And in the UK, you can be, you know, yes. even with an orchestra like the, the Philharmonia London Philharmonia, you can be, to an extent, part of the team. You just happen to be the boss. You can't do that in America. Mm. It's, it's, and it took me a while to settle into that because basically you are in charge of all the artistic staff hiring and firing and with the american federation of musicians firing is very difficult mm. if you get that wrong you can be sued personally yeah but you know my criteria for that is always if someone is hurting the orchestra that's when you have to act yeah. for the sake of the entire orchestra um uh, also the programming for the entire season the appointments of all the guest conductors and appointment of all the soloists mm. So it's a huge job. And on top of that, you um, must be, as you say, uh, available to press the flesh. And I always you said to at least be there to thank people yes. for what they're doing for the orchestra. Because in America, unlike here, sadly, they have tax breaks. If they want to put money into the symphony, Charlotte Symphony, that's money they don't give to the government. Mm. So that's a choice they get that we don't get, which is um, amazing. It's also, um, I can't, so, so from that point of view, it's a very, very big job. Yeah. And I was almost catapulted in the beginning, right back to my BBC Welsh days, which was a contract orchestra where the conductor and the concertmaster were seen to be company men. Right. Yeah. yeah sort of, you know, we would say company people nowadays, but that's what they said in those days. In other words, you were, you were like the enemy. Yes, And so coming to the Charlotte Symphony was a huge shock, not because of the size of the orchestra, because you just adjust to that, yeah. as you know, yeah. um, the, the different style of, of enabling, let's say, rather than conducting. But that a feeling that the, the orchestra were not going to trust me. They, um, you know, they, they <clears throat> what's he going to do? Is he? And there were, there were certain elements that in the beginning were, were aggressive. Mm. But after after ten years, and during that ten years, some of those people, older players, older than myself, uh, became actually quite good buddies, mm. which is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. the orchestra changed. I, I actually appointed over 
three quarters of that orchestra in the 12 years that I was music director. Wow. Three quarters. Mm. Many were retirements. Many were, I have to say, um, retirements that I suggested should happen. Mm. Also, 10 years that I didn't give, because it's a brutal system whereby you're given the job, but only for a year, and then there's a 10-year reviews, and that can be extended to two years. And if it's really not working after that, someone who's sadly brought their family to the state, to the town, and settler kids in school suddenly finds himself out of a job. I've had to do that twice. Mm. And that was hard. It was something, funny enough, that Neville Mariner hated. He hated doing it when he first went to Minnesota. And he told me he didn't do it. Mm. He just couldn't bring himself to him. Then, of course, Ado went in and famous for sorting out an orchestra fast. And Ado sorted it out. And yeah. now we have the fabulous Minnesota Orchestra, as it is. But it, that, I found, really the hardest part of the job. If it was, you know, a London orchestra or, or my London chamber orchestra, you'd just sort of say to somebody, look, this isn't working. We've got to talk about this. <laughs> you really know, you know, we can't ask you anymore and you'd be fine. Yes. But yeah. in America, you have to melt the players down in rehearsal. If you want to get rid of somebody, you have to start intimidating them. Or And I couldn't do that. I would, no. but I would, I would not let it go. If someone was playing constantly out of tune, constantly messing it up, whatever, and it was a principal player, I would just keep on at them. And you could just see them starting to crumble because the next step is you call them in. Yeah. And stop me if then this gets boring. No, you no, 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 in. no. Well, it's, it's not often been discussed on the podcast well, because it, it's a touchy subject. You know, that... no, people don't like talking about no. it. But you have to remember again that if you give some tenure to somebody who isn't up to it, and this is what I said to the particular player that I didn't give tenure to, uh, their colleagues are going to be fed up, which means mm. their colleagues are going to be fed up. The orchestra is going to be fed up, which is going to make him fed up, which is going to make his fa or her, it's going to make that person's family fed up. And and it's going to ruin so many lives. Mm. I've mm. seen it happen yeah. all my life. I've had a over 50 year career now and I've seen it happen so many times. So that's the one thing. But when there's somebody already in the orchestra who's been tenured for a long time and they're badly hurting the orchestra, <clears throat> you then have to keep picking on them. And that's just not my style. I prefer mm. to try and get people to play to their best of their ability, not the worst. Yes. And so what happens then is you call them in and it's written up. They come in with a union representative. You have the orchestra manager with you and they come into the music director's office. And so nine times out of 10, they're already in a state ashen-faced, yeah. near tears. It's, it's brutal. It's awful. Mm. I hated it. And you tell them what the problems are, and then they're given three months to improve. If it's not improved after six months, you call them in again. Usually, usually what happened under those circumstances was I would find a way for the to make it easier for them. Mm. One person went to the library, another person just wanted to let go anyway, you know, mm -hmm. and they eventually do let go. But it, and it, it's a very tough situation because you can't fire people in America. Mm. And if they wanted to, because the American Federation is strong of musicians, and that's a good thing. Um, but by the same token, it, it's also how many orchestras can completely die. Yes. Because yeah. people can sit in that seat. And of course, the longer they sit, the bigger the pension they get. Mm. So that this is America we're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 that's all good, but there comes a point when the, the, something has to be done, you know. Mm. And all the players know it, and the, but the person that has to do it is the music director. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I, I I don't miss that side of it. No. Oh, I mean, it's tough. I mean, going back through those stages, you know, you sometimes when you've got somebody there who's been there a while. Uh, I'm I'm drawing on my experiences both as somebody who's conducted the same amateur orchestra for 20 years, but also sat in the CBSO for 22 years. And I won't just I won't I won't say which one is which in these examples. But sometimes if you surround a player who is whose playing is dipping with players around them who are very very good, they'll pick up again. It can yeah. happen uh, yeah. very easily. But there there also comes a time when you know. Or most musicians are very intelligent when they realise that maybe their career is on the slide. They're, they're, they're trying, they're trying, they're trying, they're practising, they're trying their best. And often some of those players will make a decision for you already. It's it's 
and, and then when you get to that first, you call them in the first time, and you said they're ashen faced. Once it's said of them, you know things are, uh, are slipping here. Often they they will you know they'll commit their own you know okay I think you're right and it's time to retire. It's the times when people stick their feet in the mud and go right I'm not moving you're wrong I'm right there's nothing wrong that must be when your job is tough. Most of the time those people know that their playing wasn't what it was 35 years ago or 30 years ago and they know that it's maybe time to quietly slip away and as you say go and work in the library or go and you know, do something else around around the place. But occasionally you're going to have a, you know, right, I'm not moving, you're wrong. You know nothing, Mr. Arsehole Conductor. I'm staying here and doing my job. That's when it's tough, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, very yeah. tough. Yeah. But um, anyway, that's, uh, it, it. it's something that a, a, certainly a young conductor should know about and learn Absolutely. about, especially because it came, hit me like a ton of bricks when I got yeah. there. I thought, wow, I knew this was a lot of responsibility, but this is, you know, there's a lot of work to be done here. But, you know, at the end of 12 years, there's a fantastic orchestra there now. Yeah. They yeah. really are superb. Yeah. So I'm I'm thrilled to bits. It's taking them far too long to find a new music director. <laughs> but but that's okay, because I, I can hang around to, as music advisor and, and laureate, as you said. Yeah. yeah. Um, did that mean that on the weeks that you weren't in Charlotte or dealing with things at the London Chamber Orchestra, when you were away guesting, that those weeks were a lot easier for you? I mean, obviously, you're still going to be on the end of the phone. and But when you're just going to an orchestra for a week and making music and not thinking about, you know, the members of the orchestra and things like that. Oh, it, it didn't. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember seeing Gergiev and Valieri. Oh, another guy who was really good to me. Gave me fantastic lessons on Shostakovich. You know, Valieri hardly had any time, you know. Mm. But he was he was generous, you know. And Slack in the same, you'd see the pair of them stuck to a phone in every break. Mm. every lunchtime, especially Valieri. Um, and it was because they were still dealing with stuff, him in Russia yeah. and uh, and Leonard in Washington at that time by then. Mm. Uh, and it was a little bit like that for me. Mm. I, I would always be, even now as music advisor, there's still things that come through all the time that I have to do 10-year reviews and things, mm. which is why they keep a music advisor in interim yeah. before a new music director is there. So, but it, it's... Um, it's it, in some ways, it's nice when you just go to guest, and I'm sure you would agree with this, and you can just enjoy the orchestra yeah. and making the music, and not be involved in any of their politics. Yeah, yes, exactly. I, I'm yeah. enjoying that at the moment. And yeah, <laughs> absolutely. The 10 questions is imminent, but there is an 11th question that you don't know about, which every conductor pretty much has answered for me. And it's about score, study and preparation. When you have a new score or even an old one, do you sit at your desk and use your inner ear? Do you go from big to small or start at page one and work your way through it? And for the geeks, and now there are many geeks amongst my listeners, and I'm one of them, are you a red, blue, black scribbler inner of things in your scores or do you like to keep them virginally white? No, rubbish, virtually white. Don't believe in it. <laughs> um, uh, the conductors I know who have done it because Karian did it, yeah. um, never made cues, never even made eye contact with the, with the players that they needed to. Half the time they were immersed in the music and that was all wonderful, blah, blah, blah. But there's a little bit more to the job. I, I know that there was a principal clarinet in one of the London orchestras that said, if he doesn't look at me, I don't see why I should play. <laughs> whereas, is... whereas I do know another one who, because he played under Kurt Mazur, and Mazur didn't like players looking at him particularly. Whenever you look at this clarinetist, he doesn't look at you because he's got used to not looking at the conductor so much directly. Like you're, you know, we're looking at each other now down a camera lens. So it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure with Carrie, and nobody ever really needed to look at it because they knew he had his eyes shut most of the time, yeah, uh, virtually did. all of the time. Um, yeah. yeah, it's but funny, there, isn't there, it? There's a lot of uh, students ask about red, blue pencils and things. Um, I do use red, blue. I'm using red more now than I ever did as when I was younger. Yeah. But it was a system I actually learned from Rostislavsky because he came and conducted Shahrazad at the Philharmonia 
And a librarian came up to me after and said, look what he's done to this score. It's a brand new score, bound, gold philobonia written on it. Look what he's done, blue pencil everywhere. And I looked at it. And you like this, Michael. Yeah. I thought, that's gold dust. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, said, yeah. I, I, I said to the librarian at the time, I said, would you sell me that score? Mm. Uh, because Scheherazade, as you know, is one of the difficult pieces to conduct. Yeah. And it was absolutely amazing, but I, it taught me a technique of actually being able to very quickly. And I, you know, I said earlier to Simon Rattle says, "Don't memorize," and he's right. Yeah, it's a technique which you know many of us use. Most music's written in four-bar phrases. You can line four bars, and you can make hieroglyphics within those lines that can help you learn the oral uh, meaning, the eye, not ear. Yes, the the eye memory. Um, because you can't, you know, be buried in your score. When Simon says, don't memorize, he doesn't mean look at your score all the damn time. He mm. says, don't try and conduct a piece for the first time because you've gone home and memorized it, mm. like you might with a concerto, you know. It's just not the same. And when I was marking certain things, I did notice that a lot of my assistant conductors were marking way more than I was. And they would say to me, you don't mark very much, do you? I said, well, you've got to. I said, that comes with experience. Mm. And you've got to sift out what you actually really need to be aware of. Don't be, don't do the obvious thing of we know the trumpet is there. Look at him before he makes that solo. So that because they always look up, don't they? Just before they make the solo entry, their eyes go up like that. And if yeah. you're there for them, they mm. appreciate that. But be aware that the other side of the auction is the harp who is just not going to be able to make that together unless you put a very big beat down, either with your left hand or your right hand or something like that. That's the mark you want to make in your score, not the other mm. one. Mm. And, of course, then you get to the difficult beating patterns and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, it, it does become... Uh, I would, you know, each to his own. Um, but when I mentioned it to McCarris, who was also a heavy marker, I said, do you think I shouldn't mark some of these now? So what? <laughs> do what you do what you like who cares yeah exactly and and that's the 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 answer that you know i keep coming back to and now after 130 odd episodes of this podcast is that 130 different conductors do it they're in their own 130 different ways but it's whatever helps you get that music it off that page into you i i also bar off things in phrase, four by phrases and then have hieroglyphs for certain things and yeah it helps me it helps me because i know i know what i've written over the page uh, because I wrote, oh, I was there when yes. I wrote it, you know, and, and it means that you yeah. know when you know what's over the page, the music's going in. Um, and I agree with Simon. That's yeah. another thing. Yeah, um, I agree that's with Simon about with about memorizing. You know, I I only yeah. conduct three symphonies from memory, but that's because I've conducted them so much and played them so much. I know every note now. You know, exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's as simple as that. What would you do if an orchestral player spoke to you aggressively, or even tried to take over the rehearsal? How would you react if a soloist had a memory slip and needed your assistance? In recent weeks, I've started a new series on my Patreon page called What Would You Do In This Situation? where topics like these are discussed using real-life encounters. It started a lot of discussion and is proving hugely popular with my subscribers. Subscribing is very easy, and you'll gain access to articles, tour diaries, over 40 hours of interviews and bonus mini-episodes, as well as much more. If you subscribe annually, you will get a discount and a further discount if you're a student. All of this can be found at patreon.com forward slash Mike on the Podium. And from just £5 a month, you can gain access to this ever-growing resource on conductors and conducting. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com. Details and links to the page are in the show notes attached to this episode. Now, the all-important 10 questions with my guest, Christopher Warren Green. Christopher, it is time for the 10 questions, and regular listeners will know that I have always started with the same two questions lumped as one. What sound or noise do you love, and what sound or noise do you hate? <laughs> oh, dear. I love the sound of music. Mm. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> I can Sorry. hear Julie Andrews as, as yeah. we speak. <laughs> yeah, and I hate the sound of traffic. Mm. I don't like that. Yeah. But what's interesting about, about that question is that possibly the most often quoted answer to the sound that people hate is music, 
but in one specific place, in a restaurant. So when you said you love the sound of music, actually, most people haven't said that. They've said something to do with nature or birds or the sea or whatever. But it's it's very nice to hear the the, que- the first question being music for once. And, and yeah. you know, the second one I understand about traffic and also music in restaurants completely. Oh, yeah. Yes, you're right about that. <laughs> Number three is if you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? I always spend it in my garden or with my animals. I love animals. Mm. We had three dogs. Got one now. I've got chickens, ducks. Um, if I was home more often, I would have a lot more. Yeah. Um, that's basically what I love doing. And I, uh, only because, you know, I only had ever spend time in my garden when, like today, it's a gorgeous sunny day. But I imagine it sounds like you'd be out there come all weathers feeding the chickens and the ducks and, the, and, and going for a long walk with your dog. Yeah, I could have done that if I hadn't been a musician. I could yeah. have just been involved in the country somehow. Brilliant. Number four is a pretty straightforward question. Can you name your favourite conductor or conductors of yesteryear? Oh, I think I, I did earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely. Uh, well, Ashkenazi, I didn't speak about a lot. I loved uh, working with the uh, Volva. Uh, yeah. Ricardo Muti, Lauren Mazel, Heitink. Mm. Um, these are all great influences, and uh, I loved working with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do, I'm assuming you, with all of those, you also had a good relationship you know, uh, uh, right hand man, but you're not. You're the left hand man as a as a concert master or a leader. I mean, assuming you had good, good relationships with with people, and especially Ricardo Muti, sometimes comes across as being rather feisty. And especially in those early days at the Philomenia when he was younger, I think he's probably calmed down a bit now. Um, but you had good relationships with those people. If Muti respected you, right, and you did your job well, yeah, he was never no problem whatsoever, right. But if you were somebody who wasn't doing their job very well and also being antsy or, you know, lippy with him, yeah. he'd take him out. He yeah. was uh, he was aggressive in that way. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Yeah. But he was right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Number five is a trickier question for some. Uh, famously, I've, and I've said it so many times, one conductor refused to answer it because I do re- write on the email that you're not allowed to list yourself as your favourite current conductor. But who would be your favourite current conductor or conductors? Oh, current is... Oh, God, there are just too many. Um, uh, I adore, there are too many. I know, I know, I know. I, yeah. I, I, um, I adore Valieri, Gergiev. Um, and now you've asked me the name of the chap who used to be the chief of the London Philharmonic Orchestra, which has now slipped my mind completely. Um, Tenstedt? No, that's... Um, no, no, no. The, oh, we're the talking about one. current, <clears throat> yes. The young, um, the young one. Oh, Yurovsky, Vladimir Yurovsky. Vladimir Yurovsky. I've been terribly impressed with stuff that he's done live from when I was... I went to Glyndebourne and heard it, the orchestra sounding amazing. Yeah. Essa Pekka, who... Um, Essa Pekka Selen and who... I am actually kind of responsible for his career because when he stepped in to conduct a Mahler Symphony at short notice. That's right, Mahler 3, from, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Michael Tilson Thomas cancelled. The uh, managing director brought a video of him round to my flat and I said yes. Yeah. And then we met him chief guest conductor. He's done some incredibly exciting stuff recently. But there are many. I mean, I just I, I, don't, I wouldn't know where to start and stop. And there yeah. are many that I really, right, there's so many way better than me. Number six, what is the hardest work you've ever conducted? That's such a difficult question because if something, there have been some things that have fooled me like crazy that I'm trying to figure out how, is, what are the beating patterns here? What is this? And the other. But until I've really got that under my belt, I don't, I, I probably would not go out on stage thinking this is too hard for me. Mm. I just wouldn't do it. Mm. Um, it's hard to conduct pieces of music that are intricate and difficult to sort out and very unrewarding artistically. Mm. That is my main answer. Mm. When there's a piece of music that there's just really nothing there or that you, I personally can find, mm. I, I find that difficult. Um, people often say, don't they, that... I mean, the most difficult stuff to conduct, of course, is the Baroque, and then yeah. Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, classics up. And I, I say all the time to young conductors and to orchestras who are auditioning young conductors, 
it's no good. Yes, great if they're good at the um, modern stuff. Great if they do a great, good rite of spring. But if they can't conduct the Baroque mm. or the the, the uh, a Mozart symphony, I mean, you know you've arrived on an orchestra. A great orchestra will trust you with a Beethoven symphony. Mm. Mm. But, you know, too often student conductors, young conductors, they ignore this. And it's a big mistake because if you understand the Baroque, you can conduct anything. You'll find out how to phrase, where to phrase, what to do. The Rite of Spring is difficult because it goes right back to the Baroque mm. through through jazz. And the di most difficult thing about the Rite of Spring is I know a few conductors who have it memorized, but I also know that some of the greatest conductors who really specialize in this piece have made that, even after 50, 60 performances, that one fundamental foot wrong yes. in, the, in the Dan Sacra and the piece can stop. Yeah, that is one of those scary moments, and it's so easy to make, as you know, mm. that um, that mistake. But the most difficult thing about the Rite of Spring is actually making it dance. Yes, that's very make, true, and making it sing. So it must never sound as though, oh my God, am I going to come in spare here? The orchestra have to sound as they're going da, 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 ba, ba, like jazz, mm. you know. And and getting it to do that, while still making sure you don't put a beat wrong, yeah, that's... is is difficult. I'll grant you, but yeah. I would still would say the rite of spring isn't difficult to conduct. It's difficult to really bring the best of the music and the yeah. dance out in it, which is the same as the Baroque, Mozart, Haydn, uh, Beethoven. That is the difficult stuff. Well, I agree with you about you know Baroque classical up to Beethoven, that sort of area, they are the hardest. Often because you feel like a bit of an interloper because, you know, you think, well, do they need a conductor for this? Um, but then, you know, you're there to shape and you're there to help. I'm going to go back to the other answer you gave, which is conducting something which is intricate and difficult and yet musically unsatisfying. And the listener might think, well, why are you conducting that, Mr. Conductor? Let me tell you, dear listener, Sometimes as a music director, you're going to commission a work from a composer who you respect, and then they write something, then you get it, and you open it up, and you think, oh, my God, this is not as good as I thought it was going to be. Or you can do a jump in for somebody on a week's notice or a few days' notice, and they'd rather keep the programme they had than you change that modern piece. And so you open it up and think, oh, my God, this is awful. Um but you still have to be an advocate for it. You still have to be the person stood on the podium with the oh, score. Oh, absolutely! In front. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. if you've if you've taken it on, you have to find the music in it. You have yes, to you make do. the phrases yeah. with mm. new music. And it's an interesting point you make there, Michael, because with blue pencil, red pencil, whatever pencil, if you mark up a score properly and well, once you've done that, you could go out and conduct it. Yes, and. If you, uh, that's why often, I mean, with the, the mainstream repertoire, of course, you just pick up the score when you arrive. Mm. Doesn't matter whose score it is. But with the more intricate pieces and the things that you really need to remember, if you've got your own score, and this used to happen to me a lot, I would get called at under 24 hours notice. There's one occasion when I got called to the Three Choirs Festival. And the, it was an horrendous program. It was um, Firebird, um, Debussy La Mer, and Delia's Cello Concerto. Wow. <laughs> but I had the scores with me. Yeah. I, well, do you know what? Actually, I didn't have the scores on that occasion, now I remember. And the funny thing was, I stayed up all night, blue penciled them. And when I got back to America, I took those scores because I blue penciled them. I paid for them. Mm. And I'd written in exactly the same way that I had in my own score. Yeah, which is interesting. So the point is, if you have that those scores, you can step and you've marked in this way. You can step in a very short notice and you'll know you'll be able to do it. Mm, that's very true. Oh, behind me are my scores and virtually all of them are red, blued and blacked. And, you know, and I have been asked to do something obscure for the second time. And I thought, well, I've got that score, opened it up. And yeah, you, you look at it and go, well, I, I remember this. I know exactly how this goes. Yeah, and then it, it yeah. makes your life easier. Uh, I have also done the opposite, which is thought I've never conducted anything before, uh, you know, one particular piece before. I've opened up the score and halfway through playing it through, I thought, actually, shit, I have conducted this before. I just don't remember it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. right. That can happen. 
<laughs> yeah, and I also had the third option. I was doing some uh, some Schubert songs arranged by, and I'm trying to think whether it was Rager or people of that ilk arranged Schubert songs for orchestra. And uh, the scores arrived from the orchestra I was doing them with, and me thinking, I've never conducted these songs. I opened up one of the scores, and it was full of my handwriting. It had come from the BBC library. But well, there it's, we are. I have conducted it before. Yeah, It's so easily done. It is very easily done. When travelling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? My wife. Ah, so you take your wife with you. Well, uh, on I've most been lucky journeys. Because uh, Rosemary, my wife, many listeners will remember us, Rosemary Furness, the violinist and concertmaster and soloist. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> she recently retired. And in the first week of retiring, she took on a Schubert octet in Alborough and went to Abbey Road to do a week of film sessions. <laughs> <laughs> As you do when you've retired. <laughs> that kind of retirement. But yeah. I just said, you know, the, one of the problems with music directors or music directorships. And one shouldn't complain, and I'm not, mm. is it does take away your life. Yes. And I realized that at least six months of my life was spent away from the family, from the children, from home, from the animals, mm. you know, the garden. And we just decided that wasn't going to happen anymore. So um, there's, yeah, it's only the obvious otherwise. Yeah. I, well, I, I can't think of anybody else who's given that answer, their spouse. Um, good, good, which is I'm brilliant. Good. I mean, I I do know of a couple of conductors. You know, whenever they turned up to conduct the CBSO, their wife would always be there at the beginning and the end of the day's rehearsal. Occasionally, they even sat through the rehearsals. You know, God bless them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's definitely something. You know, when I've gone and guest conducted places, and I've come home and I've said to the my missus, you said, "Well, next time you ought to come with me." Um, I think mm. you'll love it there. I think it's a very pretty place. I think you know, it's something we want to do more often. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Number eight. What is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? Um, what would I change? I would, um, in all honesty, um, be a better composer. But I was encouraged by many colleagues who were, um, both conductors and composers, and they said, look, actually what you really need, what we really need, I'm talking about orchestra players, is someone up there, as I said earlier, who can enable, enable and inspire. And we don't really care about all of the rest of it. Mm. But it, you know how one single thing can often make you feel insecure. When I was a violinist, it was that I hadn't gone to study in Vienna and I'd gone straight shooting into the London Theatre land and then spent all my career as a violinist studying with, all the soloists that came to the Philharmonia from menu into, um, well, all of them, yeah. um, you, you know, thinking, feeling inadequate for mm. that. So my colleagues made me stop feeling, but if I had my life again as a conductor, I would definitely have gone much deeper into studying composition. Mm. Mm. Now, it's something I did study uh, for a year and a half as an undergrad, Having been a, a, a and I and since since then I've carried on composing and now greatly enjoy arranging and orchestrating for for uh, other people. I think at the beginning when you first start to conduct, I think it's 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 something that gives you a, a little bit of a you know a, I don't know what would you call it a body warmer. It it sort of makes you feel good because you know about transposition, you know you know what the ranges of instruments are, you know that certain in notes on certain instruments are to be discouraged or writing in a certain way is to be discouraged. But I think as you go on, yeah, having that knowledge is great. But I think the enabling and the cajoling and the you know the giving <laughs> of energy is more important than knowing that that note is impossible on a core anglais. Um, yeah, the core anglais player knows that. I mean, those yes, things, exactly. You know. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly that. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I find a lot of the things that I, I knew I forget. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> well, you know, there is that. I'm yeah. looking, looking at a score and hang on. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> Just... there's a there's sitting right next to me. I mean, is my notebook, as the listeners know, but immediately to, to, is a book on instrumentation and orchestration, which I only ever look up very occasionally <laughs> because I've yeah. forgotten what the lowest note of an oboe is. Is it a B natural or a B flat? You know, and all that sort of stuff. It's that's literally there for that. Um, yeah, but exactly. yeah, most of the time you're, it's not necessary. And most of the time, yeah, you forget it and you can find it out quite quickly. 
Number nine, like me, you've had two professions. I wonder what a third one might have been. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt or have liked to have attempted? I would have liked to be the gamekeeper or a farmer. Yeah, brilliant. Although when I say a farmer, I mean a, like a gentleman farmer who can have old McDonald's farm with all his animals and sit on his tractor every day. Unfortunately, I just got two garden tractors. Right. <laughs> I, he said, unfortunately, yeah. I'd like, I, I want a big one. I want yeah. a Massey Ferguson. I want, yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, that's what I would have done. Well, the other thing that I really wanted to, or thought when I was younger that, and I grew out of it, I thought what I did was uh, useless and frivolous. And so I thought I should be an ambulance driver instead because that's useful. But then, of course, as life went on, I realized that with music, you can care a lot for people because music cares beyond pain. So yeah. I didn't quite feel so useless, but you know, to be somebody, you know, uh, who can save lives and things like that. But my selfish me uh, would be a gamekeeper or a farmer. Purely out of interest, have you seen Clarkson's farm? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, did, was that not enough to put you off? All of the the, the legalese. I know it, uh, there was a lot of COVID involved in that, but all of the sort of um, uh, hoops, the government hoops they have to jump through, and all of the other things. I mean, I know a lot. It's a TV series, but I, I wonder yeah. whether whether it would have put you <clears throat> off. No, that's why I said I'd like to be old McDonald's farm, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Farmer, because with um, a Lamborghini tractor. Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. I think Jeremy Clarkson, like him or or, or, or whether you like him or not, yeah. um, did a great service to the farming community. Yes, I live in Norfolk, surrounded by farms and farmers, and it is really, really hard for them. Yeah, and yeah. I know I come from uh, the area where his farm is, is where yeah. I was born. And I know what um, uh, the residents feel about what he's doing. And that's all very good if you live in Chipping Camden or whatever. But at the end of the day, he's drawn attention to the fact that it's not easy yeah. what farmers are doing. And it's not great that we've got such intensive farming. Mm. You know, um, people just think they can walk into a supermarket, buy a, a chicken off the counter for two pounds. No one gives a damn whether that chicken has been in a battery cage. And slaughtered when it's still got chick feathers on it at full size. Yeah. You know, uh, sorry, I mean, all, all my ducks and uh, things are all free range. They run around eating Rosemary's flowers. She's not happy about <laughs> But um, yeah, I don't want, I would never want to be. And the problem as well for farmers is they don't have many youngsters coming into the profession. No, no one seems to want to do it. Mm. So uh, I'm worried. I just hope that the government... And think very clearly about two things, music education in schools, because we know that children, you know, uh, you're nodding your head furiously, that children and students do better at all academic subjects if they're studying the arts. Mm. And that they try and encourage the entire farming community to go back to the rotational farming with, you know, with animals as well as crops. You know, here mm. in Norfolk, we're mainly crops. Mm, but it's mm. not good for the soil and all the rest of it. So no. there are things that the government could do. So when I become dictator of London. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I'll, uh, I'll put my hand up to be in your cabinet. If if a dictator has a cabinet, I'm not sure dictators do. But, you know, you know where I'm going with this. Um, yeah, absolutely. You'll be in charge of the Home Office. <laughs> good. I mean, the music education thing. I sent a tweet during the pandemic because of, you know, all of these... Um, freelancers who'd never got paid a penny by the government to uh Rishi, the then chancellor Rishi, Rishi Sunak and pointed out to him that you know apparently you're a Star Wars fan Mr Sunak uh if we can take out all of the British elements of that so you need to turn the sound completely off because every note was played by the LSO take out all of the 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 scenes that were filmed at Elmstree any costumes that were made by British costume designers, there's about four minutes of Star Wars left, Mr. Sunak. I hope you enjoy it. You know, yeah. um, and much the same, you know, to do with orchestras, orchestras now. And um, I've sent similar things about, you know, the coronation and the British, the wonderful British music making at the recent coronation. But the, these people are literally dying out because nobody's teaching music education anymore. It's they're considered a luxury. Um yeah, I've it's got a just, whole I've got a whole plan about a national no music day one day. I'm gonna launch it 
when you know it's banned listening to music and you'll get fined for it because then people might realize it's not just the people who are playing it it's people who wrote it people who produce it people who record it there's a whole industry out there that we're brilliant at and, and we're not getting any love or any thought by anybody so let me know when i'll be there good <laughs> Christopher, if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Egg and chips. Oh. With beer. Oh, uh, uh, are we talking bitter, proper British bitter? Real, real ale. Yeah. Or, frankly, anything that's cooked by my wife because she's absolutely stunned and cook. And that's yeah. that. <laughs> egg and chips. Now, I, yeah. I know we've not had an egg and chips. In my house, that's known as a council tea. I have no idea why. I think it's a brummy phrase. Um, I don't I'm, care. I know. Neither do I. Egg and chips, and I always, I always um, sprinkle something on there. Either, either Maggie, which is a sort of a, a salty sauce that you get in Austria, or ketchup, or and a pint of real ale. Wonderful. Again, not an often given answer. I've had plenty of Malbecs in my time <laughs> listening to these answers, but a pint of real ale. Yeah. And you know what? I think were we to meet, and I hope one day we would soon. Uh, I know we could sit down over a couple of pints in a country pub and carry on nattering away and nodding and agreeing, forming our, our um, ideas to become dictator and and vice dictator of London. Uh, and it would be a great time. And and I know it would be having spoken to you today. Thank you, Christopher, for coming on. Thank you, Michael. I've really thoroughly enjoyed it. A Mic on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat with a Finnish conductor who also started out as a violinist, but then she went on to study conducting with some of the biggest names in the profession. She was the first female to be appointed as a music director of a Finnish orchestra, and earlier this year, she became the principal conductor of the BBC Concert Orchestra. But until then, bye-bye. Bye. -bye.